Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class from HowStuffWorks.com. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy B. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. We are coming up on the 100th anniversary of one of the worst train wrecks in United States history, if not the worst train wreck in U.S. history. Sometimes you will see it listed as the worst train wreck ever. That is wrong. That is definitely not true. It really pales in comparison to some of the world's deadliest wrecks. So, for example, in 1917, there was a train carrying French soldiers that derailed in France and then caught fire and more than 600 people died. Trains are a lot safer now than they were 100 years ago, but we still will have train incidents with huge fatality numbers. A lot of times, there are things that happen during natural disasters. So a train in Sri Lanka was hit by the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami, and that killed more than 1,000 people. So by comparison, the great train wreck of 1918 was a lot smaller than any of that. More than 100 people died. That was a lot for the time. Uh, And even though it's usually noted as the worst train wreck in American history, it was also kind of a run-of-the-mill accident. So the death toll was large, but the circumstances that led to the accident were typical. So we're going to start out today with a look at why the railroad industry was so dangerous at that time before we get into the actual wreck. So as Tracy just indicated, in the early days of the railroad industry in the United States, trains were extremely dangerous. There were no standards for reporting injuries and deaths, so the numbers about exactly how dangerous are a little bit scattered. But in general, hundreds of people died and thousands were injured in connection to the railroad every single year. Between 1882 and 1892, the year with the fewest deaths was 1885, during which 307 people were killed. 1890 was the worst. 806 deaths happened that year. And passengers and workers alike died in things like collisions, derailments, bridge collapses, and boiler explosions. It was particularly dangerous for the workers, with one of the most common sources of injury being the process of coupling and decoupling train cars. The cars were connected using these link and pin couplers, and you had to physically get in between two train cars to connect them or deconnect them from each other. 44% of on-the-job injuries for railroad workers during this time happened during coupling and decoupling cars. The industry was so dangerous that manufacturers of wheelchairs, crutches, and prosthetic limbs advertised specifically to railroad workers. And railway surgeon became its own profession with its own professional organizations and its own medical journals. Railway surgeons were usually general practitioners who also performed surgeries and amputations. And as the industry grew, they provided both routine and emergency care to railway workers, as well as to passengers who became ill or were injured. So at first, the railroad started employing doctors because the crews that were building new railroad lines were way out in remote, inaccessible territory. So the railroad needed to have its own medical staff on hand rather than expecting there to be a doctor anywhere nearby to come help in an emergency. But over time, this blossomed into an entire medical system, sometimes funded by the railroads and sometimes funded by the railroad's employees. By the time of the great train wreck of 1918, nearly every railroad in the United States had its own medical organization. And while routine care was part of the job, they were also approaching it as though they were going to be treating injuries among both workers and passengers and that these injuries were basically inevitable. Unsurprisingly, in the face of such dramatic and obvious dangers to both passengers and workers, there were huge calls for safety legislation. As a general rule, the railroad companies opposed this legislation, while the emerging railroad labor unions supported it. So the railroad companies were, in many cases, paying for medical staff to treat injuries while opposing the legislation to require safety measures that would have helped prevent them. It took a long time to pass the laws that people were asking for. Public demand for some kind of safety legislation started as early as 1870, 
But the first major piece of legislation came more than 20 years later with the Safety Appliance Act of 1893 that was passed over the ongoing objections of the railroad companies. This act required better powered braking systems. So before the brakes were very rudimentary, they were manual. You basically had to have a brakeman on each car applying these brakes manually to get the train to stop. So this was requiring powered brakes, and they had to be installed on enough of the train cars for the engineer to stop the train from the engine without having to have individual brakemen controlling a lot of manual brakes on each car. The Safety Appliance Act of 1893 also required automatic couplers that could be operated without a worker having to get physically in between two train cars to do it. The Safety Appliance Act of 1893 went into effect in 1900, and it was amended in 1903 to clarify various issues that arose once railroads were attempting to comply with it. Another act in 1910 added more safety requirements and empowered the Interstate Commerce Commission to establish standards for safety systems. A 1907 law set maximums on working hours for railroad employees on the grounds that exhausted workers were more likely to make fatal mistakes. So these laws and the safety standards that they required definitely made the railroads a lot safer. On-the-job injuries for railroad workers dropped precipitously even as the number of workers in the industry was growing. Passenger deaths dropped as well. These improved braking systems meant that when trains collided, they usually did so at slower speeds than they did before, so the wrecks were not as deadly. But the trains still collided. The number of train wrecks per year continued to increase after all these laws were passed, in part because of an increasing number of trains on the rails. The number of annual wrecks peaked in 1907 with 39 wrecks in the United States that year alone. It was about that time that professional publications in the industry started talking about some kind of automatic signaling and train control systems, which could help prevent collisions rather than just slowing down the trains before they ultimately hit each other. Those sorts of systems already existed, but they weren't mandatory until after the wreck that we're talking about today. The call for it came before the wreck. Congress directed the Interstate Commerce Commission to start investigating block signaling systems and automatic train control systems in 1907. And that investigation was the first step in requiring these types of systems. In a block signaling system, train tracks are divided up into sections called blocks, and the signals let the engineer know whether the block ahead is clear or not. Before the development of automatic block signaling, keeping these signals up to date could be really imprecise, as in a worker with a stopwatch would clock the train when it passed and then mark the block as clear when it should have been clear. But once the train was out of a worker's line of sight, that was all guesswork, with no way to really know if the train had to stop for some reason. The telegraph helped with this because train orders could be sent up and down the line rather than basically by estimating and hoping that everything was going as planned. But this was still prone to all kinds of problems. Sometimes there wasn't even an employee with a stopwatch. There was just a timetable of when the blocks were supposed to be clear, and you would just sort of hope that everything was on schedule that day. Automatic train control systems are just what they sound like. They're systems that can automatically adjust the speed of the train. Although at the time, sometimes they were used in a broader sense to mean all kinds of different automatic safety systems, including signaling. Although the ICC was investigating these systems in 1907, formal orders to install them didn't begin until the 1920s and 30s. And these systems almost certainly would have prevented the great train wreck of 1918, which we are going to get into after we first pause for a sponsor break. The Great Train Wreck of 1918 was a head-on collision between two trains from the Nashville, Chattanooga, and St. Louis Railway, also known as the NC and St. L for the Dixie Line. The two trains involved were the number one express from Memphis and the number four from Nashville. The collision happened about five miles or eight kilometers away from the main Nashville train station between Harding and a roundhouse that was known as Shops. The number one express from Memphis was being pulled by locomotive number 281. Behind the locomotive was a baggage car, followed by five wooden passenger coaches. 
Following those were two Pullman sleepers, one made completely of steel and the other with a steel undercarriage and ends. On the number four from Nashville, there was Locomotive 282, followed by a combination baggage and mail car and then another baggage car and six coaches. All of the number four's cars were wooden. Both trains were segregated, and the front passenger cars were the Jim Crow cars. This was the worst place to be on the train. It was the closest to the engine, which had its own dangers from the boiler to the likelihood of an accident. It was the smokiest place on the train because of the smoke from the engine. So that is how the layout of the train was. On the number one from Memphis, a lot of the Black passengers aboard were going to work at a new DuPont munitions plant in Old Hickory, which is part of Metro Nashville today. The number one had left Memphis around midnight on July 9th, 1918. Normally, it arrived in Nashville at about 7.10 in the morning. The number four normally left Nashville at 7 a.m. Under normal circumstances, the two trains passed by each other in opposite directions on a stretch of double track between Nashville and Shops. This was about two and a half miles, that's roughly four kilometers, away from the station at Nashville. Any time that there was a delay, the number four would wait at Shops until the number one train had passed. The railroad had a set of standard procedures about which train on the tracks had the right-of-way And when it came to approaching Nashville from the west, the inbound trains had priority. On this particular morning, though, both trains were running late. The number one from Memphis was about half an hour behind schedule, and the number four headed out of Nashville was about seven minutes late. Before it left Nashville, the number four received an order to meet the number seven, running under engine 215 at Harding. The order also noted that the number one train was being pulled by engine 281. And this was all to help the crew aboard the number four correctly identify the number one. So after getting these orders, the conductor on the number four had a conversation with the engineer about it. And he said, the number one must be some late this morning, but I don't believe the mail is going to delay us, so he will have to change that meeting point to Vaughn's Gap. Vaughn's Gap was the next stop west after Harding, so he was basically saying, we're going to have to meet that number seven at a different point. According to the conductor who survived this wreck and was interviewed later, he and the engineer, David C. Kennedy, had a conversation that left him under the impression that they would be delayed on that stretch of double track for a while as they waited for the number one to pass them. But when the number four got to that stretch of double tracks by shops, a different train was headed in the other direction. It was a switch engine, or an engine that was used to move cars from one place to another for logistical reasons, rather than hauling passengers or cargo. Switch engines at the time were usually smaller than the ones that hauled passenger and freight trains. When the switch engine passed by the number four, the conductor was collecting passengers' tickets. He heard this other train, and he assumed what he was hearing was the number one, but he didn't personally go look and check which train it was. A switch engine passed by shops at about 7.15 in the morning, at which point the number four continued onto that single track and started picking up speed. And that's when people in the operating tower at shops realized that something was wrong. The tower operator had been on duty for less than 10 minutes that day, and no one had mentioned to him that the number one was behind schedule and hadn't arrived yet when he got there. He only realized it after the number four had already passed the tower And then he noticed that the number one wasn't listed on his train sheet. The operator contacted the dispatcher and told him that the number four train had moved onto the the single track, but that he didn't think the number one had arrived yet. The dispatcher told him to try to stop that train. So the crew at shops dropped the signal to stop, and they started sounding the emergency whistle to try to get the attention of somebody on the number four. This didn't take long. The number four was only about a train length away from the tower. But its crew either did not hear the whistle or didn't heed it, and the train continued to pick up speed. At this point, both trains were approaching a stretch of track called Dutchman's Curve. It's a sharp curve in the track, which is also on a grade. And an overhead highway bridge and a stretch of forest also blocked the view of the other side of the curve. So even though the weather was clear, it was impossible for the crews on either of the two trains to see each other until it was too late for them to stop or even really slow down. The two trains collided head-on at 7.20 in the morning. 
Both trains were traveling at an estimated speed of 50 miles or 80 kilometers per hour. The conductor on the number four said he felt the air brakes being applied on his train before the collision, but the conductor on the number one said he did not. The engineers and stokers of both trains were killed instantly, so we have no detail about what was happening in either locomotive in the moments before the impact. These two locomotives propelled each other upward in an inverted V before they fell down into the cornfields on either side of the track, with the number one's locomotive falling on the west side and the number four's falling on the east. Both locomotives were virtually demolished, with their frames and their machinery being stripped completely free of the boilers and destroyed. Here's how the ICC report described the number one train's cars after the wreck. Quote, The baggage car was completely demolished. The first coach lay crosswise the track, the combination car of train number four being driven into its side near the center and its rear end torn completely out to a depth of 12 or 15 feet. The second coach was derailed and its forward end went down the bank and rested on the front end of the boiler of locomotive 281 and its rear end rested on the roadbed on top of the frame and other parts of locomotive 281, its forward end being badly broken and damaged. The third coach remained on the roadbed with its forward end jammed against the rear of the second coach. The rear trucks of this car and the four following cars were not derailed. And here's how the report described the number four's cars. The forward half of the combination car was demolished by coming in contact with the first coach of train number one. The baggage car was completely telescoped with the first coach to its rear, both cars remaining upright, but were practically destroyed, as shown by figure four. The end of the second coach was demolished for a distance of six or eight feet and partially telescoped with the rear end of the coach ahead of it, The three rear cars of train number four were not derailed and only slightly damaged. According to news reports at the time, 121 people were killed and 57 were injured. The death toll cited today comes from the ICC report, which was 101 killed and 171 injured. But it's likely that some of the injured died after their injuries after that report was completed. It's not totally clear how this broke down between employees and passengers. The ICC report lists both the injuries and the deaths as 87 passengers and 14 employees. As we mentioned earlier, the cars in the front of both trains were the Jim Crow cars. So most of the passengers in the cars that were completely crushed during the wreck were black. Between 80% and 90% of all the people killed in this wreck were black. And we're going to talk about the aftermath of this wreck after we first pause for a little sponsor break. Conditions at the scene of the 1918 train wreck were gruesome. Even though one car did catch fire, the first people who arrived on the scene to assist were able to put that fire out. But the front cars on both trains had been crushed completely in the wreck, and a lot of the bodies were too damaged to be identified. And the cars were so gory that butchers were asked to come from Nashville to help assist with the cleanup effort under the idea that they were used to that much gore. Black and white doctors and nurses came from Nashville to render aid. The Nashville chapter of the Red Cross was on scene as well, and several prominent women from the Nashville area came with typewriters so that survivors could dictate letters home to let their families know that they were safe. The impact was also audible for several miles. And in addition to the rescue workers and other people who came to the scene to help, a lot of people just came to gawk. There are reports of between 40,000 and 50,000 people coming to the scene. But since there were only about 120,000 people living in all of Nashville at this time, that seems like maybe a little bit of a stretch. There was also a children's home not far from the scene of the wreck. And it's not clear whether the children saw the wreck itself, but they definitely saw its aftermath. Also, while there were definitely souvenir hunters who took pieces of this wreck away, people's valuables and luggage appear to have been left alone. Wrecking crews arrived shortly after the accident to remove the wreckage and clear the tracks so that train service could resume. Injured people of both races were taken to City Hospital and Vanderbilt Hospital, while the dead were transported to black and white mortuaries in Nashville. The black mortuaries in particular were overwhelmed by this huge volume of bodies that was brought in. 
The Interstate Commerce Commission started an investigation almost immediately after the wreck. The ICC had been established in 1887 to act as an independent regulatory body, and it had been empowered to investigate train accidents in 1910. By today's standards, this investigation was really rudimentary. They interviewed several people who worked for the railroad, and they produced a seven-page report with about five pages of pictures that was dated August 16th, 1918, a little more than a month after the wreck happened. The ICC's conclusion was that the accident was caused by the number four train being on the track at Dutchman's Curve when it wasn't supposed to be. The number one train had precedence, and the number four was supposed to wait at shops until the number one had passed. But since Engineer Kennedy was killed instantly, it's really unclear why they didn't wait. This is especially true since multiple people who were interviewed by the ICC said that they knew this engineer to be a careful man who adhered strictly to the rules. This definitely was not a case of inexperience. The primary crews of both trains had years of experience, and the only person on either crew who was new to the job was the flagman on the number four train. It also wasn't a case of fatigue, or at least not fatigue caused by overly long shifts. The number four train's crew had been on duty for less than an hour when this wreck took place. So there's some speculation about what happened, that maybe Engineer Kennedy mistook that switch train for the number one, maybe he just overlooked a signal somewhere, or maybe he thought that because the number one was running so late, he could make it all the way to Harding before the number one did. That last one seems kind of unlikely, given that multiple people said that he was a man who drove the train by the rules, because the rule was to wait for the number one at shops, not to try to beat it to a completely different stop. Yeah, that seems like it would be a wild departure from his normal behavior. One of the problems that the ICC did find was this. The rules on precedence were clear, and the rule was that the number four train should have waited for the number one at shops. But there wasn't really a good way of passing information related to the train status. Although the operators in the tower at shops had a train list, there was not a formal registry of the train's comings and goings. Instead, the crews were in the habit of just asking the operator whether the other trains had come in or not. The operator's duties included running the track switches to control which train was on which track. So as a general rule, the operator would probably have a sense of which trains had come in and which ones had not. But that was also not his actual job. It was the dispatcher's job to know specifically which train had come and which hadn't. So the ICC recommended implementing a procedure in which the trains would only proceed if they had confirmed with the dispatcher that the train that had precedence had already arrived, or that the train would only proceed if it had an official order to do so. And the ICC also recommended the sort of block system that we talked about at the top of the show. In the words of the report, quote, With this volume of traffic and in view of the universally recognized features of increased safety afforded by the block system, there can be no valid excuse for the failure or neglect on the part of the railroad company to utilize existing facilities for the purpose of operating a block system on that line. The ICC report also noted that there would have been much less loss of life if all the cars on the trains had been steel instead of wood and recommended that the passenger trains phase out their wooden cars, and that ultimately did happen. This wreck was, very briefly, national news. But because this was also in the middle of World War I, it was quickly overshadowed by wartime news. And the fact that so many of the victims were Black meant that after the initial reporting, it just didn't get as much attention in the white press. Today, there's a historical marker near the site of the crash, which was placed in 2008 for the 90th anniversary, and it's also the subject of several ballads and songs. I did not realize how colossally dangerous trains were in their early... I mean, there's the obvious amount of danger, but I didn't realize it went quite to that extent until I looked at all those numbers. Do you also have some listener mail that maybe involves less loss of life? It doesn't actually involve less loss of life. Oh, Tracy, no. It is about our episode about Hurricane San Siriaco. Um, So it's, there's also loss of life in listener mail today. Not specifically, but uh, this is from Rosadel. And she says that she's a librarian in Puerto Rico. 
which was great. We got several emails so far from people from Puerto Rico talking about their experiences. So Rosadel says, I've been listening to Stuff You Missed in History class for years, and it was a huge surprise when I saw you worked on an episode about Hurricane San Siriaco. You mentioned several times that there were a lot of parallels between San Siriaco in 1899 and Maria in 2017, but I was not expecting them to be so eerily similar. I lived through Maria. It was one of the most horrifying experiences of my life. It was a shock to listen that way too many things I lived through last year and certainly still currently live were repeats from 1899. In our history classes, we weren't taught on what happened after the U.S. invasion and how precarious the situation was before San Siriaco struck Puerto Rico, much like what happened with Maria. Just to mention a few parallels, currently we are dealing with a massive financial crisis that has led into buildings not receiving their usual upkeep, a decline in our economy, and brutal austerity measures. The slowness in the federal government's response and the racial assumptions to try to help the least as possible, happened in Maria as well. Migration to other areas of the United States also happened, except that Maria's aftermath resulted in a mass migration to states such as Florida, Texas, and the Northeast of the United States. I felt that I lived almost every single point discussed in the episode, but with Hurricane Maria. At the end of the episode, I was enraged that essentially the story repeated itself almost 119 years later, and we had truly missed it in history class. On another note, thank you so much for discussing the political events in Puerto Rico in the decade of the 1890s, something else we missed in our classes. The background on the island was very complicated, and it's one that is not understood well up to this date. Particularly, I was delighted when you used the word invasion to describe the events of March 25th, 1898, when, as some folks say around here, quote, the Americans came to the island. Not a lot of people around here like that word, but that essentially was what happened. Fun fact, July 25th is now a date to commemorate the establishment of the Puerto Rico Commonwealth on July 25th, 1952, and there are few mentions on what happened in 1898, except maybe in small circles and also on social media. So the email goes on to say, like I mentioned before, I felt enraged by the end of the episode, but it truly has become one of my favorite episodes ever. I hope this episode raises awareness on Puerto Rico's history and complicated background and opens the door to deeper discussions about the island's past, present, and future. I truly appreciate all of your work on the podcast and keep up the amazing job. Gracias. Tons of love from Puerto Rico. Thank you so much for this email. I had a lot of those parallels in the original episode outline, and it was becoming this, like, many, 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 many minutes long digression. (laughs) And so I ultimately removed them from the outline, and I was very glad to get them in the email so I could read them now. So thank you so much for sending that along and for listening to the show and to the other folks who have written to us from from Puerto Rico, because there have been several. If you would like to write to us, we're at HistoryPodcast at HowStuffWorks.com. And we're also all over social media I missed in history. That is our Facebook and our Twitter and our Pinterest and our Instagram. And you can come to our website, which is MissedInHistory.com, where you will find show notes on the episodes Holly and I have worked on together and a searchable archive of every episode ever. And you can subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and wherever else you get podcasts. For more on this and thousands of other topics, visit HowStuffWorks.com. 